Hey, I don't really have a sermon for you today. I'm just going to talk to you if that's all right. I asked the worship team to give us a little extended worship time this morning because sometimes it just feels good to praise the Lord a little longer, right? Sometimes you just need that. And so I appreciate the worship you guys led us in this morning. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about like last year, 2019, and a little bit about this year, 2020 to you. Uh, I was, you know, it's interesting, I, sometimes I read verses, I don't know if you guys do this, but like, there's this crazy passage in Ephesians, I'm not going to unpack it for you, but I'm just going to read you a few verses. In verse 14 of chapter 3, Paul said, For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in your inner person. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height. And to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or even think according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Sometimes don't you read a passage like that and you get the feeling like the Apostle Paul is trying to tell us there's something powerfully rich about being a Christian. There's this mystery of the university or the, the universal uh, concept of God in the universe. He's coming down and he's touching our hearts and our lives and awakening something powerful. There's this spiritual life to live that defies comprehension. It's deep and it's wide and it's high and it's strong. And we say, Lord, I just go to church. I, 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 there's something in there, but I just go to church. And sometimes... Going to church, honestly, blocks us, I think, from receiving all the things Jesus has for us. I hate saying that. I'm not supposed to say that, right? True. You know who it's worse for? It's worse for people that work in the church. That's harder for people who work in the church, who serve in the church, who set up coffee, who lead the worship team, who sit in the sound booth, who are back there with children right now, who greet at the door, who come in and sweep, who move chairs, move stuff around, who serve on the leadership team or sitting in board meetings and stuff all the time. You know how hard it is to work in the church and not get lost in the work of the physical environment of church and lose sight of Jesus and the Holy Spirit? And so as we look back at this last year, 2019, there's times that just felt like God was doing huge things, but man, for a leadership team, we felt lost in the business of church. I mean, we had this leaky roof problem, right? So we had knew that all this time, from the time we moved into this building, it leaked from year one. And uh, we had spent $30,000 trying to get a roof, and it, didn't, it failed, it didn't work. We called insurance, and they wouldn't cover it because they said it wasn't installed properly, and so we're stuck, and the roof kept leaking and leaking and leaking, and finally we assembled enough money and our savings and through the generosity of you guys that we could raise $50,000 to replace the roof, right? Look at us, what are there, like 75 people in here, right? 50 grand's a lot of money for a small little congregation to raise. But we did it. We, you know, we, got, we raised like 25, and then we ended up you know, having 25 in savings. And so we ended up having the roof started. And they had to tear the entire old roof off to put the new one on. And, of course, we know the story that as they got from that corner to about where that TV is on day one, that, that night a huge thunderstorm happened at the end of July. We came in the next day, and this place was flooded. Right, big pools over there. Thanks, Joey. And big pools over here. He's gonna get me some water, so you can tell already. I don't know why I don't bring it up here with me by myself. I should all learn to do that by now. But I got Joey for that. He's always thinking. He's always a sorry. Right. So, and we thought, oh, we just fix the floor. We'll just get it going. Well, thanks, Joey. We'll get a couple of, you know, we'll mop this up. We'll clean a few spots here and there. We'll replace a few boards, and you know, we thought we'd be, oh, we'll be back up and running in three days. But by the third day, the floor had buckled more and more and more. And we realized this whole thing shot. Not all of it, maybe 75% of it, hallways were okay. And then we realized we have to redo the entire floor out here. 
Well, that means we've got to redo the floors down the hallways and over there, lift up the barista bar, take up the stage, get under the sound booth, whatever we got to do, right? And we had no idea how much that was going to cost. Now, we had already been told by the insurance, we're not going to cover your roof leak. So now we're like, oh, what are we going to do now? Our coffee shop gets shut down. We're going to be down for 10 or 12 weeks. We're like, well, while we're waiting to hear from insurance, we better get started. We know something's got to happen. We've got to tear the old floor out. Right? We had to get, take this stage apart. We'll clear everything out. Lift the barista bar up. So let's start tearing things out. And between you guys who came down and helped in the United States Navy, who showed up one day to help, I don't know if you even know that, about 20 people in the United States Navy showed up. They were on there at a weekend, and we tore everything out and made it happen. And we hadn't even gotten to the place yet of installing the new floor. We had to tear through like three layers of flooring to get down to the subfloor. It was a lot of work, right? For those of you who were, who were doing it, you know the feelings. And, and then we got the new floor put in the bid. The floor was 30 grand. And we're like, 30 grand? We're just, we're in this middle of spending 50 on a roof. Where are we going to get 30 grand for crying out loud? Well, we do have a little bit of money still in savings. Maybe we could just, let's figure out how to get it going. And meanwhile, let's pray hard. And the insurance finally came through. And of course, because we did the work ourselves, the insurance paid for not only the new floor, but the labor that would have been tacked on for having torn it out. And so they gave us a check for $62,000. So we end up with a new floor and 30 grand extra. And so hey, 2019 in some ways was good to us. Yes. Yes. Right? But from a leadership team, from an from a in, involved team, you know how much of our effort and our energy and our focus and our time and our strength and our passion and our worry and our prayers went into the building? It's like nothing's wrong with that because we end up with something better. But as we go into 2020, we're talking a little bit about what do you think Jesus wants to do with us? now that he's done this much. Now there's still more to go, by the way. We've got, we're still talking about developing our parking lot and getting a farmer's market out there. And we've got some options there happening. And so that still might happen. But we've thrown, we're focusing and we're looking at like, what do you think Jesus wants us to do to kind of reorient ourselves? How do we find the height and the depth and the width and the breadth of this love of God that Paul was talking about, this mystery of the glory of the Spirit of Christ revealed in our lives when we're slaving away trying to put new flooring in the building. And so one of the things I thought is as we enter into the new year in 2020, let's start with some kind of a focus where we can sort of tune out all of the busyness of life, all the taking care of kids and going to the job or trying to stress about your retirement, how that's going to work, or all the things that go on in life that just distract us from spiritual things. Maybe we could take a, a weekend and focus on our own spiritual lives. And so we decided to get in touch with the Genesis Institute. Now, if you don't know the Genesis Institute, I think I've got a slide of who they are. Um, the Genesis Institute is a local counseling center that does workshops and things. They do pr courageous parenting classes as well as other things. They do personal counseling for people that need it. Very biblical focused, very serious. It's hard for a pastor to recommend therapy, therapeutic counseling because half the time you don't get any Bible or Holy Spirit in it. Yeah. Right? So I'm always, I'm always looking for those who are like, give me some Bible. Will your counselor pray with you? Will they quote scripture to you? Genesis Institute will. And so I recommend them a lot. So we've been talking with them. And by the way, they've been holding board meetings here and different people. We've got Sean, you're still on their board, right? Sean is on the board of Genesis Institute. And I know Chris Wrights has been involved with them for quite a bit. And some of you may have uh, uh, gone to their huge evenings that they do down at the convention center when they do a fundraiser and that kind of thing. So we've been friends with them for a while. And uh, one of the classes that they offer is a soul restoration workshop. And they usually offer it like two hours a night for 12 weeks for, you know, every Wednesday night for 12 weeks. It costs $160 a person. We're like, whoo, we can't do that. That's a lot of money and a lot of time. And, and they say, well, we do offer a, a shorter workshop version that's like only $60 a person. And we can do it over a, like a weekend or over all day Saturday. And I said, well, have you ever done like a Friday night, like do two or three hours of it on Friday night and maybe we throw in dinner? And then come back in the morning, we'll eat breakfast and we'll do the other six hours. So we get a little breathing space and not just eight hours of drinking from a fire hydrant. They're like, well, we've never tried that before. But that sounds great. And I said, well, maybe we could set that up. And I talked to our buddies at City Church and Garland Church and Olive Branch Community Church and a few others. Because we did that big Easter service together five years ago. We took an offering that day and we got $5,000 in the offering. We set that aside and we said, let's save that for something we all want to do together. Well, five years has gone by. We're like, what do you want to do? And I said, hey, how do we use that? How about we use that money? And there's about 3,800 of it left now. How about we use that money to underwrite the expenses to do this and we could get it down to like 25 bucks a person 
with meals. And they're all like, yeah, let's do it. And we said, okay, so Friday night, January 17th, and Saturday, January 18th, we have this soul restoration, spiritual formation workshop where you get to kind of calm your life down, and it actually teaches the skills about how to stop and hear God. How to not be caught up in the busyness of church. How to not do church, but instead hear from the Holy Spirit. How to, how to listen in, how to, how to find Him, how to find rest and peace being a child of God and being under God the Father. And it's like it's super intense. And so we had three different people here who have come up and said, hey, you know, I think, I think that workshop is so cool that $25, if that's a stickler for somebody, all scholarships of folks. And another guy secretly said the same, and another said the same. I'm like, so, oh, now we got a whole bunch of scholarships. So here, here's what we're going to do. I think the next slide tells you how to sign up for this. Uh, you can go to thegatheringhouse.online, and actually you can even do this right now on your phone. I won't, it won't bother me a bit. You can go to thegatheringhouse.org online, and you'll see this, you'll come to this page, www.gatheringhouse.org. So scroll down till you see latest news. You'd scroll down, you'd see this, because latest news, and then you'll see the little you know, emblem, and it says click on this, you click on that, and you'll see uh, information about the spiritual formation workshop that we're going to do. And then there'll be a line at the bottom, a website with all that gobbledygook. You click on that, and it'll give you this page. Now you notice, you get to this page, it says City Church Spokane. Because they're controlling the funding. They've got all that. So the tickets are actually bought. We're all doing this in partnership together. And then where it says register, you would just click register. And when you get to the register page, you've got to go through, oh, I'm this, here's my email, this is my phone number, blah, blah, blah. It's not a big deal. It's all private information. It's all secure. I did Tanya and I. I signed us up already. And you'll get there so you can see that we're on there. And then you see that little place says, oh, do you have a promo code? So you can click promo code, and then what will come on is a screen saying, put in the promo code. If you enter the code TGH2020, you get in for free. Okay, so you put in the code 20, TGH2020 and you get in for free and set aside that weekend so you can start your new year of 2020 saying, the one thing I want to do before this year begins, I don't want to do another busy routine life where I'm driven, 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 trying to find God, taking care of the kids, go to work, go to school, do this, do that, make this, and I never found time or space or even got the skills to find out who Jesus is. I'd say, then, let's take a Friday night and Saturday together, have dinner with each other. It'll be about 80 of us from three different churches, 80 or 90 of us. We'll be in here. We'll have a dinner together. We'll have a continental breakfast on Saturday morning. And let's do this workshop together. And we've even made it free for you. So how can you beat that? Right? And when I say we, I'm talking about those three or four people who stepped up and said, all scholarship folks, all scholarships and folks. Now, if you were like, oh, can you repeat all that again? No. But after certain church, you can come right here to this stand and they can register you right here. And so you get that night set aside, and I think we're gonna enjoy that together, because I would love to see it's all like, what changed for you in 2020 that was different than anywhere in your life? And I'd love you to say, you know, in 2020, I learned how to be totally at peace with God. And I began to see the breadth and the length and the depth and the height, and to feel what it's like to experience the riches of His glory, of His inheritance in the saints, just like Paul talked about. So we got that going. But we have a couple other things going too. And I want to bring these to your attention because, you know, churches, it's, it's amazing how much that the, whole, the New Testament talks about the poor. When Jesus ended up in Luke chapter 4, when he ended up sitting in front of his hometown, and he's going to reveal his ministry, he unrolls the great scroll of Isaiah, and he goes, bam, right to a passage in Isaiah. And his opening words were, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to, anyone know the rest of it? Preach good news to the poor. The very first thing, open the eyes of the blind, release the prisoners trapped in darkness, those things, he said. But his opening is, preach good news to the poor. Right? And then you have Paul later on in Galatians, he's talking about the first time he met Peter and James and John, and they extend to him the right hand of fellowship, and they listen to the gospel that he's presenting, and he tells them, and they're like, yeah, that's the gospel of Jesus. You weren't one of us, 12, but you're in, and they extend the right hand of fellowship, and they encourage you of, of only one thing we want you to add to and make sure you do, which was what? Make sure to remember the poor. And Paul says, the very thing we were eager to do. 
It's amazing how much in the New Testament, remembering and taking care of the poor is one of the basic admonitions of whether or not you have the real thing. You got the real thing when it comes to Jesus, taking care of the poor is part of it. It's mixed in there, right? And we like to ignore it because America, we think, I go to church because it's all about what Jesus can do for me, right? I'm here because I want to learn what can Jesus do for me? And Jesus said, no, 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 I, I have given you my Holy Spirit so that you can be a blessing to others, especially the poor. That's what Jesus is saying to us. So we ought to have ways in which, well, how can we do that? Is there a way we can maybe get our toes wet? Maybe just not jump in the deep end, but maybe we can kind of wade into the pool of working with the poor. And I have jumped in the deep end, and it ain't any fun. Wrote the whole book about it, Lessons from a Church in Zombieland, Swimming in the Deep End of the Pool, Working with the Poor. Uh, at one time, I was the president of the Spokane Homeless Coalition, and a, uh, a judge and a prosecutor and a defense attorney came to me. And they said, um, we have an idea. We've been doing court up at the courthouse, the municipal court. We do all the basic misdemeanor cases that are downtown, jaywalking, disorderly conduct, public drunkenness, this kind of thing. What happens is a street person who has these misdemeanor offenses, they get arrested, they go to jail, they spend four or five nights in jail, and then they're told, you gotta come back here next week, and uh, you're gonna be in court, and of course they miss the court date because their lives aren't organized, and now a warrant goes out for their arrest, and next time they got a disorderly conduct, and they're standing on the corner yelling or something, it's, oh, there's a warrant out for your arrest. So they arrest the guy, and they take him in, and they put him in jail another four or five nights, and he finally shows up to court, and then they say, okay, here's what you need. You're gonna be sentenced to 10 days in jail, uh, time served already, we'll give you that, and now you gotta do this, this, and this, and they would stand there and say, well, I don't have ID, and I don't have housing, and I don't have this, and I don't have that, and I don't have, no one's helping me get food, and I can't get anything, and then the judge would say, okay, go out and get that, and come back next week. And of course, they would never show up next week, and a warrant would go out for their arrest, and so the cycle went. So, basically, a street person disorderly conduct charge was now costing the taxpayers eight to $10,000 a piece, because it costs us $135 a night to put someone in jail. And they said, well, maybe there's a smarter way we could do this. Maybe instead of having them come to the courthouse, we could set up an alternative court. Maybe we could set up a court downtown in the public library, and they could come in here, and they could be in a room that's not so intimidating. They could meet with a judge. They would never be sentenced to any kind of jail time. All they would ever get is community service, and they would help them figure out how to expunge their record. And when they say, well, I can't get ID, and I can't get housing, and I can't get food, and I don't have this, and I don't have that, let's put the service providers in the room right next door. And so we can say, excellent, go right next door. Someone will help you get Social Security. There's a lawyer there, Rosemary Ware. Oh, go right next door. Catholic Charities will be there helping you find housing. Oh, go right next door. They'll sign you up for food stamps. So go right next door. We'll do that. And then a lot of these people, they can't even, they're not even eligible for services as long as they have a warrant out for their arrest and their records aren't clean. So they had to get their record clean to get social security, to get housing, to get food stamps, to get any of the things they needed to sign up for, and that would be in the room right next door. And they said to me, they said, the only problem we have is this court has never been done. It's experimental in New York City right now, and we're gonna try to launch it here in Spokane. And the only way we're gonna get people to come to this voluntary court option is if we can give them a free lunch. Will you pack the sack lunches and make us a lunch for about 100 people every Monday? And of course, at the time, we were doing meals downtown, and I'm like, okay, sure, we'll do that. To which my wife always says, don't have any more ideas, Rob. Because <laughs> they always mean work for her. And so for about a year, and I don't know, we've been doing it six years now, there's a community court, you can actually go on and read about it, and uh, that's the uh, downtown public libraries page. And go to the next one. Yeah, there's our judge right there in the middle. That's uh, Mary Logan. She's the judge. She comes here oftentimes. The other judge over there, Tracy Straub, she's here all the time about once a month because the Racial Equity Council meets back here once a month in our room discussing racial righteousness and how that's going to work in Spokane and how we could solve those problems. But that's the judge, Mary Logan. And um, So we've been doing the lunches. And I think the next picture is, the next couple of pictures are, oh yeah, that's what it used to look like. Every Sunday night when church was over, we'd go home, we'd have family dinner. At the end of family dinner, we would pack 100 sack lunches. And my buddy Ben Koss is there and Brian and our family. And we did this for over a year. We finally moved into this building, and then people in the church said, well, can I be a part of that? And so we would set up tables and the sack lunches and things, and we'd set them up over there. And what we never quite articulated was, you know, we would do the labor, and then people from the church, Bill, and, uh, Jerry and Carol Williams are here, they would take it down to the public library on Monday and hang out down there and give it out. But, you know, the church never financed that. 
So sack lunches are costing $600 a month in order for us to buy the supplies to put together 130 sack lunches. And so you're asking, where to get the money? Well, two ways. There was a group of donors, uh, almost none of whom attend this church, who regularly gave to Streetwise to support this. Uh, the vast majority of our donors li literally are out of state. They live in California, Chicago, they're over in Seattle maybe, they're people who donate to us because they believed in doing this and they're friends in our friendship network. A few, uh, there's a few people here who've given some big chunks uh, every now and then and that's been great, but that's how we did it. Or I would write grants. And I would write grants and Provident Healthcare would give us a grant. And City Councilman Mike Fagan would give us a grant. There would be this grant money that would come in to finance the $600 a month. In fact, that was just to pay for the lunches. But the other thing that was needed all the time was, well, someone would stand in front of the judge and say, I, need, I don't have the $40 to fill out the ha housing application fee. And they were like, God, can we get this guy 40 bucks? We get him 40 bucks, we can get him housed. Or they would stand there and say, well, WorkSource has a job for me, but it's a labor job and I need work boots and gloves and I can't afford work boots and gloves. Or it'd be someone who said, well, I need, I need a refill of my prescription medication, which is 20 bucks, and I gotta wait until the end of the month because that's when I get my check, so I'm gonna go two weeks without my meds. And there were all these little things that would come up, and there was zero funding for that. So I would write another grant, and I would get money, so I was able to get like an additional 500 a month to pay for those kinds of things, bus passes, so they could get around town, that kind of stuff. And that's basically how we've been running it for six years. Until, you know, Tanya and I got exhausted going and buying pudding and applesauce and doing that all the time. Every week we're out there, it's like, it's Saturday. You know how many Saturdays I got interrupted this year? It's like, oh, we gotta go buy pudding and applesauce and bags and like, again? Fed up with that, right? And so I was like, when then, then suddenly the Our Lady of Lords downtown, the Catholic church down there, they're like, hey, could we, can we get in on this deal? Well, well, well what can you do to help? Well, we have a bunch of laborers who wanna make sack lunches and we have $60,000 to give. Right? We're like, well, that's, uh, I suppose we could talk to you. <laughs> Even though you're Catholics. <laughs> right? Uh, and so, basically, through a lot of dialogue, they, we, we worked at that they could take two months. And they took November and they took December. And they've been doing the sack lunches downtown. But at the same time, we were like, well, we're, we're not done. We don't feel God saying we're done, right? Um, so I met with some people here, and we then, afterwards, Tanya, I met with Judge Mary Logan, and they said, here's what we would love to see. They said, you know, this court has been so successful cleaning up the records of people, getting them housing, getting them into systems that they need, that we expanded the court to the East Central Community Center about two years ago. And East Central Community has a different class of poverty people, I would say. They're not living on the street. They're struggling and they're living in really, really low-end housing over there at, in the Hilliard area and that kind of thing. But they have had like a 19-year-old girl and her baby who were living in a car show up and can't get her records expunged and that kind of thing. So they've had like 40 or 50 sack lunches going there. And uh, many other cities in the United States have now come to Spokane to learn how to do this. Uh, King County has actually had a meeting it has a meeting this week, or just had a meeting this last week, to come and learn how to do it. Um, New Mexico has come up, Arizona has come up. It's amazing that other cities are like, they got this court going in Spokane that we all need to learn about. And so other cities across the nation are coming to hear, how are you guys doing it because you're changing And the judge told Tanya and I just last week when we sat and met, she said, the success rate of the East Central Community Center, the average person who comes in there is way higher than the success rate of the street people downtown. You could guess why, right? A little more stable, a little bit more desiring to make it actually. It's so successful there that we're, we think this year in 2020 we're going to expand and do an additional court at the West Central Community Center. And so they said, what we would love to see is could you guys take the East Central Community Center and when we expand the West Central and we'll let the Catholic Church do the downtown one? And that cuts our sack lunches down to about, for a while, down to 50 apiece. And we're like, sure, we could do that. Okay, and then as it expands, we'll probably go back up to 100 when West Central does. And it also gives us opportunity to say, on Tuesday, we could go to that court and figure out what else do you need? What does the young 19-year-old girl living in a car need besides getting her records expunged? Does she have the things she needs to raise a baby? Does she have a stroller? Does she have... What else could we be doing, right? If we had people in our church who could get directly involved, we could be doing way bigger than just handing a sack lunch. 
So we felt like, is this a good thing to do? Is this what Jesus might want us to do? And build relationship there. And we thought, yes. The problem is, okay, so if we only do 50 sack lunches, it's still going to be 300 a month. Where are you going to get the money? And we said, well, let's do a fundraiser. And we decided that the fundraiser that we think we ought to do is Murder Mystery Dinner Theater over the um, February Valentine's weekend. We have a guy who's come to our church several times. He's actually a playwright. And he and his wife have written plays and done Murder Mystery Dinner Theater for a while. And it turns out that we have people like Rainey and Gabe who led worship today and Joshua who's sitting there who actually have degrees in theater, right? And we said, let's use some of this untapped talent. My daughter also has a degree in theater. We have untapped talent here. Why don't we put on our murder mystery dinner theater, charge 40 bucks a person. It will not only pay for the cost, but we think we can raise $3,000 over the three nights. And we said, all right, let's, let's pull that off. Let's do that. And that way, it'll be enough money that we should be able to finance the sack lunch hole program for at least the rest of the year. And if we'd like, we want to also give out, you know, bus passes and boots and gloves. And I could keep writing grants, although I'm tired of doing that by now. We could do some other things, but we could find, maybe we do another one in the fall and we raise another three grand. Right? Depending on how good you guys are, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're expecting, we're expecting, and it is going to be a musical, right? It's a musical show, so it's going to be pretty cool. So this kind of stuff, and we're going to want some help to put this thing on. We're going to need some help at the kitchen side and the table waiting side. We thought, this is a way our church could get involved saying, we actually are helping do something for the poor by putting on musical theater, right? And it's like, that's kind of a nice entry level, easy to do. But also all of us united together saying, this is the kind of stuff we want to do. We want to finance and fund ministry that's happening, even though the, the judge and the original prosecuting attorney and defense attorney are all Christians. That's kind of what they got, where they got it going from. You know, we could find ways that through relationship, we think we could bring Jesus more to the table in the poverty world through relationship. But if we start here, it'll open up the doors wider and wider for us to do that. So in February, three nights, the 13th, 14th, 15th, we want to do murder mystery, musical theater, raising funds for those sack lunches. Does this sound good? That's kind of cool? All right. And then on that note, we thought, well, okay, that's cool to do our local kind of, how are we going to get engaged in the poverty world here and make a difference? And I like really making a difference because... You know, we've done just feed the poor thing. Feeding the poor doesn't actually lift anyone out of poverty, right? That's why we like doing the sack lunches with the Spokane Community Court, because it actually is a tool that lifts people out of the poverty they're in. It's more than just food. So we like that. We thought, well, okay, that's what we do locally. What about globally? Is there something Jesus wants us to do? Because, you know, the poorest of the poor in the United States are still rich by the world's standards, right? We... By the world's standards, even our poorest of the poor are filthy rich. And we thought, well, we don't really know what to do in that. But luckily, our denomination does. In our denomination, we have a branch of it. There's a division called Covenant World Relief. We're the Evangelical Covenant denomination. And Covenant World Relief is actually run by like three or four people in a cubicle in Chicago. And why they said in the cubicles, they said, because we don't want to see the dollars that come in get wasted on office space. So they're inside the corporate offices, but they are more boots on the ground. They're like, we want to be out there flying around the world, seeing things. And they realized we're a small denomination. We're only about eight, 850 churches. They said, instead of us reinventing the wheel all the time, we're going to go out and we're going to find partner organizations who are already in the countries we want to be in who are small little organizations, but they've built the infrastructure and we're gonna come, we're gonna come alongside and help support them. And so they have three areas that they work in. Covenant World Relief does, go back up one, one, one more, back, 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 one more. One is community development. Community development might be where they walk in and you're like, this is where we're going to put in wells, we're gonna build some kind of windmill energy sort of things for things. We're gonna do tilapia farms that we might build. There's something that goes on there. Community development can also be micro business enterprise for women. It can be the type of thing, because you know, they, studies have shown over and over, if you can lift the women out of poverty, you can lift the whole village out of poverty. 
right? So that's a huge deal. And then uh, they also do disaster response, global disaster response, which is still going on. Because, you know, it's all, it's all cool when Haiti gets wiped out in a giant uh, hurricane, and then everybody gives money to it. And guess what? Five, four or five years later, they're still a mess, but it's no longer fashionable to because nobody cares anymore. But they're still broken. They're still in their infrastructure is ruined. So Covenant World Relief will stay in country long after it's no longer fashionable, still working on disaster response. And then there's another a division of it, which I think is the next slide. Um, this is part of their whole, uh, you can see some pictures of the kind of things they do. Employing women in the Congo. The Congo is the poorest country in the world in Central South uh, uh, Africa. And there have been war torn for so many years, and civil war has been raging. And so women will get raped by the opposing side and then have a baby. And now they're ostracized from their community because they had a baby out of wedlock. And so they've gone in there with a group uh, and partnered with a group that teaches, you know, their rights, their rights to their children, how they can hang on, health issues, how to raise the babies. And they teach them sewing skills or culinary skills or cleaning skills and gives them a job to lift them out of poverty. Uh, so that's happening in the Congo. In Rohingya, Burma has basically driven out whole populations of people that they just didn't want living in their country, ethnic groups, and they've driven them across borders and stuff. And so there's whole refugee camps that are in Thailand and other places, and they still get bombed and rocketed and that kind of thing. But they don't have the sanitation that they need, so there's medical groups that are happening there in the Rohingya refugee care. And of course, there's water projects. That, I think the one at the bottom is the blue uh, Project Blue is an opportunity to bring clean water to places that don't have it and eliminate dysentery and eliminate uh, so, you know, so much bacteria, so much infection, so they do that. And we thought, well, what if we could get involved in something like that? What, what if we could be doing clinics? What if we could be building wells? What if we could do it? We were like, well, we're not sure how to go about it. So Pete Kasmer, are you even here, Pete, today? I think Pete's not even made it today. Pete Kasmer called up Covenant World Relief. And he talked to the top head honcho, his name's David Husby. And he said, you know, because that's what you can do in our denomination. We're small enough, you can actually call the people in charge and they'll answer the phone or they'll respond to an email. And he said, David, we want to do something. What could we do? And David said, well, how about this? Why don't I come out there in April and spend a Saturday with you guys? And we'll just do a little conference and we'll talk about all the things that we do and how it kind of works. And you guys can kind of pray and pick some projects. And there's two other Evangelical Covenant churches in town. Why don't we partner with them too? And maybe the three churches would unite. You guys would decide to do one big project, like a $10,000 clinic in the Congo. But let me come out there for a day and hang out with you guys. And let's just spend some time talking about all that we do and see if God would light that up. And when he says us, he means all of us, right? So on a Saturday, on April 18th, we're going to bring David Husby out. We're going to talk about Covenant World Relief. And we're going to spend some time discussing whether we should be involved in the disaster relief or doing clinics or clean water projects. And I think, Annette, aren't you already kind of launching a clean water project going on? You're already, is it Project Blue you're working with or the other one? Uh, the 6K for Congo. The which one? The 6K for Congo. So oh. Okay. So, and is already kind of steamrolling with one of these babies already. So... But our whole idea is like, you know, it's really easy for a church to get self-centered. We don't mean to. We're not trying to. It just, you know, you start talking about floors and lights and fixing a building up and, you know, upgrading children's ministry or upgrading whatever you need to do. You start thinking about what we need, what we need to do this. And we start looking very, it's very easy for us to do that. And every now and then we got to break out of that and say, Jesus wants us to give a certain certain percentage of our lives, our money, our efforts, our energy, and our time towards giving to others who won't ever be able to benefit us. They won't be able to give back to us. But Jesus is calling us somehow outside of ourselves. And so we think if we don't actually purposefully do that, we're just going to get lost looking at ourselves again. We don't mean to. It just happens. It's happened in every church I've ever been in. I've worked in six different churches. Right? So these are the kind of things we want to do for the first three months of 2020, where we're going to say, look, we're going to focus on first our own spiritual lives, lining ourselves up, and then we want to focus on how can we reach out to the poor in Spokane and do a better job of that and getting more involved in that. And then let's do a global focus in April and see where Jesus takes us. Because our thinking is he's been stabilizing us, doing some cool things, he's going to do, we totally anticipate he's going to do some new fresh things with our coffee shop, 
But let's look outside and say, Jesus, where are we going? Where are we going this year? What do you want us to do? And uh, that's the talk I have for you today. So I'd like the worship team to come back up. I want to close with a song. And uh, you guys are doing How Great Is Your God. I love that tune. And uh, let's, let's see about spending a moment in worship where as we enter into a new year, we say, Lord, you are a great God. And a great God should be able to do great things with a small amount of people. In fact, that's the Bible story over and over, right? I mean, how many stories in the Bible is that one guy left standing alone and Jesus is going to talk to him, the Holy Spirit's going to work with him? How many times is a guy who amasses an army like Gideon and God's saying, all right, send everybody home, you only need 300? Right? How many times has God scale everything down to a small number because he says, it's in the small numbers that I can really work with you because we're Americans and we like big numbers. Big numbers are what matters to Americans. But God says, yeah, that always steals my glory. Let me do big things to a small number. Let me take, I don't know what we got, 75 people sitting here this morning. Let me take 75 people and do big things with them. But we have to be willing we have to be faithful and we have to let him do it so as we sing how great is our god i'd like you to stand and this isn't just a song that we're singing because oh god is great this is a song we're going to sing because from our hearts we're saying i believe in you god to do great things through me this year I believe in you, God, to use your power to do something big in me, and that big thing in me is going to spill into the rest of the world. I don't know what it is you're going to do, but I'm going to trust you're going to do it because you're a great God, and I want to know the depth and the height and the width and the breadth and the length of your glory this year. That is our prayer that when 2020 ends all will see how great you are not how great we are but how great you are and that we will sing and praise and honor your name and laugh with joy and wonder and splendor at what you do with us we thank you that you have brought us through a year Lord and we're still standing some just barely but we are still standing you are not done with us. And so, Lord, we invite you to unleash your power and your grace and your wisdom and your love and your mercy in us and through us to the world around us. May we become ever and deeper your servants and understand what it really means to be your children. We praise your holy name and give you honor and praise and glory. In the name of Jesus Christ, who is the King of kings, and the Lord of lords, the creator of the universe, we pray. Amen.